And one of the key questions that we may see around is, is it relevant for what we are dealing with that are, in our case, a sustainable solution to end hunger? And the first point I want to, to make is, yes, there is a, a very important nexus in terms of food security and the COVID-19 situation. And here I, I just quote, uh, basically two uh, gentlemen from India in the BBC piece of, of yesterday, where they clearly acknowledge the situation coming from the coronavirus, but on one hand they will say, even if we need to be contained and uh, confined, sorry, uh, we need to work when you are in the informal sectors, you don't have social safety net, you don't have an employment check, every day you work to gain money to feed your family. If you don't work, you don't feed your family. Um, so here you have two people that are not farmers. Eh? Uh, one is on the service uh, sector of construction. The other is also in service, even if it is a food system, as a street food seller. Uh, but they will be potentially the core victims of uh, the coronavirus. And as they say, even if you don't die from coronavirus, they may die from hunger due to the current situation. So what it means in terms of the, the four dimension of food security that we may uh, be uh, used to deal with. And here I have wrong them for the less impacted to the more impacted. So on the herbability side, so if you think about in terms of food production, there is no issue or problem yet. Meaning that planting decision doesn't seem to be impacted in the Northern hemisphere. People already have their input and they are committed. And actually the planting decision, for example, in the US are pretty high. And similarly in the developing world, we, uh, for smallholders, they, those smallholders are going to work on their piece of land. They are not going to, to stop uh, harvesting or planting. So for most of the staple food uh, in the North and in the South, we are pretty good. What we can see is more direction on some high value product that are labor intensive and in some cases rely a lot on seasonal or migrant workers within country or across countries. And that's going to be a major issue. Uh, and you start to see it in Canada and Europe, people say, okay, we need to have people coming to, to take care of the fruits and vegetables, otherwise we will have a problem. So that can be a much more limited uh, impact in terms of food supply. What we start to see now is, um, as usually in terms of crisis, policymakers doing uh, the wrong decision by implementing uh, trade restriction and export bans, even if they don't know yet if there is a problem. So we have seen Kazakhstan, we have seen Vietnam. So you have some food suppliers that start just because they're afraid to uh, try to lock in um, their grains at home and that will create problems and panic. Utilization. Um, we are going to see potentially with this problem in some uh, nutritious food uh, and perishable products that are uh, important in terms of food diversity and that can be disrupted first because we don't have people to uh, pick up fruit in the tables then you will see potentially some bottlenecks uh, in terms of logistics more border control that will also lead to more post-harvest losses uh, and um, for people that uh, like to buy perishable goods it means that they have to go often to the grocery store or the market and in the current confinement situation it will not take place and so you see people uh, having um, basically going back to canned food and uh, staples. So we may have a bit of issue with utilization. In terms of access, that will be a key drivers. It's where basically we are going to see first loss of income for people. So they will not be able to buy food and or we are going to see also in some places driven by panic and hoarding behavior. People are creating basically this artificial shortage with price going uh, up the roof. Uh, both in develop and developing world. But really the key aspect that is uh, here written in terms of food security is stability. So the point is, we are not talking about a long-term shift in agricultural productivity or a long-term shift in terms of income generation because people have uh, lost education, uh, many years of education and human capital. No, we are going to recover, but we have this very acute uh, potentially focus crisis for a few weeks. And of course it may lead to uh, some long-term impact. And for some particular uh, group of the population, uh, if you think about elderly people that cannot really sustain themselves um, independently, uh, they may be even disconnected from the food system at all. 
and here the problem is how you, you bring them food and things like this. So really the stability aspect here in terms of food security is key. Uh, knowing that it may not be the thing we are looking at it the most in CRS 2030. So in terms of uh, looking at this, really this question of macroeconomic impact and if we have less growth, uh, we are going also to have more poor. And so this is what we have done at IFPRI. Uh, using the model that is very similar to what we use in CRS 2030, even if a bit simplified just to, to be uh, in a quick response mode. And what we see here is that even if we have a one global, uh, one percent reduction in global GDP, uh, we are going to have more than a one percent increase in poverty and uh, actually of, of hunger. Uh, and also we have to keep in mind that in any crisis, the poorest are always the, the the, it the most. But what you will see also on this uh, slide is you can see different patterns between Africa and Asia and especially when we associate this 1% global recession to different drivers because in this case we use a very um, simplified scenario where I say okay what's happened if it is coming from uh, the labor supply and, and the labor productivity with people that cannot go to work, or if it is more a, a global shutdown of the economy, or if it is really about description in terms of transportation and trade restriction. In the three Ks, so my three bars, blue, orange, and red, it's always calibrated in a way that will, it will lead to a global recession of 1%. But the way that we are going to get this recession as a children's impact between region and group of the population. So, put it differently, we are dealing right now with a crisis that actually is going to have a supply side story, a supply side effect. People cannot go to work. Some factories are shut down. You have also a demand side effect. People doesn't want to go to restaurant. People doesn't want to do tourism or cannot go, okay? So, shift in preferences. And you have also a problem of logistics and basically trade costs between the two. And part of it is directly driven by the crisis. Part of it is driven by the policy mix that is currently implemented and how people communicate and how people react. And actually the same type of, uh, the same global recession we can discuss in headline, depending about what drivers will actually cause it will be quite important. So, the type of number we have, we can consider as relatively optimistic because right now, most of the people, are, well, most of the macroeconomic projection talk about a bigger uh, drop than 1% of global GDP. Yeah? For some countries, we are at 7% for the Netherlands, 4 or 5% for, for Singapore and, and so on. So um, that's going to be uh, important. On the other side, and that's my uh, green circle, keep in mind that it's more a transitory shock once again. We are not talking about poverty that is driven by structural problem, like you have a war and people are going to destroy capital or livestock has been killed, or you are losing productivity for a long term because let's say that like with HIV, you are going to have a long-term impact on your health. Here we have a short term shock, very important shock that we may have not seen for, for decades or even never at the global level with people that stop to work during two weeks, three weeks, one month. So it's a kind of forced vacation. But when we recover, people will be back uh, to, to full speed very quickly or they will may go over speed. So that's where we have to be careful about thinking that yes, on the short run, we are going to have hunger issue. We are going to have poverty issue. For some household, it can have also a few long-term consequences. But for the global economy itself, we can recover pretty quickly. So it means that by 2030, we may have gone over a lot of what we are uh, going through now. So because CRS 2030 is talking a lot about Africa, uh, what are the good, the bad, and the ugly for, for the continent? The good is that it's a young population and we have high humidity rate and temperature and most of the COVID viruses doesn't like it. For your uh, own personal culture, you may know that we, on an annual basis, we are already dealing with four COVID viruses that have been uh, emerged in, in the last centuries or even in the last few decades uh, 
uh, and now I've moved to a seasonal things. And most of them have really few penetration rate in Africa due to these uh, specificities. Of course, virus can mutate and, and things like this. So I will say that from a purely uh, biological point of view, based on the demographic of their population and the agroecological zone in which they operate, uh, Africa has a strong asset to be resilient to the COVID-19. Now, on the social and economic front, that's different. High level of poverty, meaning that any shock, once again, is big to eat the vulnerable population deeply and on a large scale. They have clearly a problem to access to water and uh, good water of quality. So this is where, for instance, the WHO is rethinking the type of, you know, uh, instruction they are giving in developed economies saying, you have to wash your hands, you have to wash your hands, but to wash your hands, you need to make sure that you have water that is not contaminated and you have soap. Two conditions that may be very big, difficult to get in many African countries. So WHO is adjusting their recommendation. And overall, the health system is relatively of low quality. Uh, and therefore, uh, for people that will be sick, that we, we don't see respirators or things like this. Now, thing that I consider as ugly and make things worse is that in some country, you have this high pocket of HIV population. Some of them are young, but that they can be totally um, decimated by the, the virus. Uh, in addition to the generic economic recession of the COVID-19, uh, you have a few things that will hit Africa strongly. First, what's happened with the oil prices? The situation of oil prices is partially due to the global recession, but mainly due to the oil war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. But for many African economies, they depend on the price of oil for their uh, external resources and for government expenditure. Tourism is another important source of income for some of these countries, and it's totally an industry that is totally uh, destroyed right now. Uh, remittances for migrant workers and seasonal workers will also be cut. And similarly, for workers that are currently uh, in the north, due to inactivity, they will not be able to send remittances. Last but not least, we can also see cut of ODA or redirection of ODA to more emergency package. So, and it means that for public finance in Africa and overall for the uh, economic system of Africa, we have some of these dimensions that are not the main source of worries in the north that are going to be important for this continent in particular. Or similarly for, for China. I mean that in the case of China, the fact that oil price going down is a good news for them. They don't really depend on tourism uh, resources, no more on remittances, and they don't depend on ODA. So you see that the same type of economic crisis is really magnified for, uh, for Africa in this case. And last but not least, you have a large informal sectors. And so it means that we have even have some policy challenges to deploy solutions to address the population in, uh, in this case. Once again, you don't have unemployment payment. Informal workers will have to work, so you cannot implement confinement and so on. Now, uh, I'm going to conclude relatively quickly. Uh, for the uh, CRS 2030, what it means. So in terms of research agenda and quantification, Yes, we are in a situation where most of the drivers I have identified before will mean that if we try to take them into account in, or in a revised baseline scenario, what we have not done yet, and we may do it, we may not do it, that's something we can discuss, uh, cost may go up. Once again, we are going to start with a higher level of undernourishment initially. We are going to, to potentially to have lower GDP growth. Now the question, as I said, is how quickly the world is going to recover? So maybe we don't really need to change our baseline because by 2030, uh, most of the problem will be solved, but there is a bit of uncertainty here. Um, so it depends also what will be the future of the, the disease. You know, it's going to be a seasonal disease. Are we going to see a few couple of years we have with peak of recontamination uh, until that most of the population has developed their own uh, immunity? And once again, this is another COVID virus and even if it's not identical, there is some similar pattern with the flu. We, we are not panicking with the flu because most of us have been exposed to the flu and we have some degree of natural immunity and we have vaccine for the population that is more vulnerable. In the case of COVID-19, the problem is that we don't have vaccine for the vulnerable and most of us have not been exposed to this virus before. So we are not resilient to it. 
But after a few years, we can have a more uh, normal management of such crises. Uh, lower demand coming from lower economic growth will mean that we will have lower prices, including for food product. So for 2.3, knowing that we are interested in doubling the productivity uh, of uh, farmers in value, so in economic impact, the fact that their yield will not go down, but the fact that their prices will not uh, go up or may, may, may go down is a, a bit of, of additional pressure for them. So more people hungry and more difficult to double the poor people income, that will push the price high. Now we have also this question about how people are going to absorb the, the, the mammoth stimulus that people are trying to do. Public debt is going to increase. At one point, we have to pay it back. How we are going to pay it back? By cutting investment, by cutting growth, by cutting investment in agriculture. I think that's an important question everywhere. But when you put it in the context of ODA, it can even be more uh, sensitive. Right now, we have a very conservative assumption in the project. We are saying that without the additional amount of money, we are maintaining existing level of ODA in terms of constant dollars. So we are not even indexing it on the GDP, especially of the donor country. So it means that the fact that we have more or less growth is not going to impact our um, amount of ODA we were putting in the baseline. So this is why I say, um, to some extent uh, here, we, we are a bit immune of, of this problem, uh, but is maintaining it uh, in constant in, in level uh, is realistic or not? I think that that's an open question. I put just a small graph just to show you for advanced economy, what has happened on the public debt. So we, the world has still not recovered from the last big stimulus package coming from the 2007-8 economic crisis. So the last time we had a big crisis, we have basically increased the uh, public debt at the world level for at least for uh, with advanced economies from 70% to 100%. And normally after a few years, you say, okay, governments are going to reimburse. We are going to go back to something we are used to. This is not the case. So we are doing a big stimulus package in a situation where we have an amount of public debt that we have not seen also for, for, for decades. So, are they going to be sustainable or are going to people to start to cut uh, public expenditure uh, in the coming years? And ODA will be cut first, uh, especially if you see the type of uh, government, or at least policymaker that are on the rise with the crisis. Uh, they are not the most uh, open-minded in terms of international aid or cooperation. In terms of environmental sustainability, no big impact about what we do. Um, the fact that we have more or less economic growth has, of course, an issue in terms of emission. The fact that we have low or high, uh, in this case, lower oil prices may also mean that the decarbonization of the agriculture in the baseline um, is going to be reduced. But actually, how it impacts the model, there is uh, both positive and negative effects coming to this. Maybe in a nutshell, the story here that if you, uh, for instance, just think about land use. If you have a lot of uh, economic growth in your baseline, so before we implement our scenario, we may already have deforested everything we can deforest. And so we have done, we have already hit the boundaries that we allow in terms of emission in the baseline. So it means that everything that we need to do when we do the scenario, is to go through intensification. So more or less, it means that, yes, we will need to increase production without any more slack in our carbon credits because we add, uh, uh, use all the carbon credits in the baseline without achieving SDG2. Now we are in a situation where with all our economic growth, we may still have a carbon credit. And actually when we are going to achieve SDG2, we are going to use this carbon credit to use SGD2, so we can do it at a potentially lower cost, but with a higher footprint of agriculture in terms of uh, carbon. That may be a bit still complex for you, just to say that there is, in the mechanics of the model, effect that mean that lower growth now can mean that it can be more costly or less costly to uh, achieve the sustainable uh, outcome in terms of greenhouse gas emission. 
and we need the model to get the final answer. Uh, Exante is very difficult to say. Now, that was for the number of the model, about how we use the numbers. And I think that it's my concluding slide. Uh, for the philosophy of CRS 2030, there is a useful things to keep in mind and to use on this crisis. Right now you see some uh, picture I taken from a blog uh, and I will come back to it. But I think first what we see that policymakers continue to make avoidable mistakes during this crisis. And in the point that we are saying that it's good to inform policymakers about how to do good things, I think CRS 2030 is still uh, on spot. Then what we also have demonstrated with this crisis is waiting is costly. All the countries that are waiting to take decision are going to pay a very high price to this. And that's very similar to what we are saying in terms of narrative for SDG2. The more you wait, the more it will be costly. It's much better to take decision early on. Even if they are a bit costly at the beginning, after 10 years, you recover your investment. If you just wait, you go to the catastrophe, last minute action, very high cost. Last, and it's really this question about, in this complex world, we need a data-driven approach to optimize policy making. And that's the point that is made in this blog by um, uh, Thomas Prio, that I think it's a very nice blog called The Armor and Dance about how you manage the crisis. And what is showing, even if it's a bit simplified, is starting by this first uh, chart 13, when you see a number of policy action coming from cheap to expensive and show which country have implemented uh, them. And so you see, for example, that Italy that is on my, uh, on one column here, um, has not taken some of the action that Korea has taken, for instance, or Singapore has taken. And basically, Italy is paying the price now. So you can have an inventory of intervention and you can rank them for cheap to expensive. But then also you need to know how they will impact here your, your, um, your rate of um, dissemination of, uh, of the infection of your economy, of, of your, sorry, of your uh, epidemic. And the fact that you are going to uh, close some bar and restaurant, yes, can impact your, uh, the dissemination, the fact that you are uh, banning uh, travel also. So you can start to rank which intervention has the strongest impact on your variable. Here you have one dimension. And by the way, it's not simple than that what we do. And after you're presenting this type of joint table where you will say, okay, what is the impact of the intervention? Do, what is the confidence in terms of the benefits that we have? So is it strong impact or not? And are we confident on our assessment of the impact? Then what is the cost of this intervention? What is the confidence on the cost? And then he proposed a ranking to take intervention or not. But you know, this type of approach that people try to illustrate with this crisis is exactly what we do actually in a more complex setting because we have not one target but several. But this is this idea of data-driven approach to optimize policy action. Uh, and that's all, it's 20 or 30 minutes.